Last week, Judy Thompson and I discussed the Alec Murdoch trial on episode number 72 entitled, If We Were On That Jury. We discussed why we thought he was guilty just as the jury was beginning to deliberate. In case you were living under a rock, the jury deliberated only an hour or so longer than Judy and me. They unanimously agreed with our assessment and found Alec Murdoch guilty of the murder of his wife, Maggie, and their son, Paul. Next week, I promise to produce an episode that is just for laughs. Lord knows some of us could use some laughs after the six weeks of this trial. And those who did not watch could also use some laughs, I am absolutely sure. But before I move on, I have some comments to make about this entire saga. And I need to memorialize my thoughts so I will never forget. There are lessons to be learned here for the long haul, you know, even though Alec had no idea he was teaching. Right, Mr. Murdo, I sentence you to the State Department of Corrections on each of the murder indictments in the murder of your wife, Maggie Murdo. I sentence you for the term of the rest of your natural life for the murder of Paul Murdo, whom you probably love so much. I sentence you to prison for murdering him for the rest of your natural life. Those sentences will run consecutive. That is the sentence of the court and you are remanded to the State Department of Corrections. And officers may carry forth on the imposition. Viewing life from a hearse, it could be worse. Laugh, think, and cry with the country undertaker. After 21 months of speculation and six weeks of trial, aired daily on various networks, the Murdoch murder saga is over. As I've mentioned, there are no winners here, but there are lessons to be learned for all of us. In the end, after a jury of 12 members of his community unanimously found Alec Murdoch guilty of the murder of his wife and son, he denied his guilt. Like Ted Bundy, even those who knew Alec Murdoch well realized he was a person who showed no regard for right and wrong and ignored the rights and feelings of others. That is a classic definition of a sociopath. That's a sociopath. You know, it would go watch what Ted Bundy, Ted Bundy did when they sent us down. He said it was absurd that you're sentencing me, I'm innocent. You know, there's a lot of similarities. Before pronouncing the sentence, Judge Edward Cowart let Bundy make a statement. I'm not asking for mercy. For I find it somewhat absurd to ask for mercy for something I did not do. Judge, I tell you again, I respect this court, but I'm innocent. I would never, under any circumstances, hurt my wife Maggie, and I would never, under any circumstances, Hurt my son, Paul Paul. That's a sociopath. For over a hundred consecutive years, the Murdoch family has been in power in coastal South Carolina in the 14th Judicial Circuit. This circuit includes Five counties, by the way, Hampton, Colleton, Allendale, Beaufort, and Jasper. It is a pretty much given, with that sort of power longevity, abuse and corruption should be the expected result. <laughs> Interestingly, the solicitor of the 14th Judicial Circuit was manned by the Murdoch family for 87 consecutive years. That position is elected by voters for four-year terms. 
in the five counties in which they have jurisdiction. The bottom line is the people who vote are ultimately responsible for the corruption that has taken place in their world. Powerful people have a way of sucking others in. They use their power to do favors for people who need favors. Recipients of special favors become indebted to the people in power and they become their slaves. Ultimately, the powerful can get away with most anything. I am going to help you is a common phrase of the powerful. If helping you helps them, maybe they will help you in the short run. But ultimately, the powerful are all about helping themselves and the corruption only grows. There's no doubt that Alec Murdoch is a product of longtime family power and corruption. I would also venture to guess this is not the only judicial circuit in our country where voters are unwittingly giving others such enormous power. By the way, this same principle can also be applied to all elected officials and is another lesson to be learned. We elect our public servants to office for a time certain, on purpose. The problem is, in many cases, we continue to elect the same people over and over because of their experience, popularity, our view of them helping us, or our knowledge of them. When we do that, we are subject to the same possibilities that happened in the 14th Circuit in South Carolina. We the people have a way of bringing on the corruption that victimizes all of us. In the Murdoch case, we clearly see examples of the power and corruption. For example, the night of the driving under the influence boat accident in February of 2019 when Paul Murdoch was driving and Mallory Beach was tragically killed. Alex Murdoch and his father, Randolph III, showed up at the hospital in Beaufort very quickly where all the kids who were injured in the accident were taken. A very drunken Paul, as usual, had called them to come to his rescue. Responders and volunteers were frantically searching for Mallory in the Beaufort River at the same time. The Murdoch lawyer father-son team, former longtime solicitor and a current assistant solicitor, seemingly had no concern for the missing girl. But they were concerned about protecting their son and grandson from legal consequences. Alec even wore his solicitor's badge outside of his pocket to be seen so it would look like they were investigating the accident. They barged into every room where the kids were being treated to let them know they were there to help them. Typical phrase. They told them not to speak to authorities and even tried to confuse the issues as to who was driving the boat. Alec even made a call to one of the kids' parents while they were on the way to the hospital. He told Connor Cook's dad that Connor was driving the boat saying that was a good thing because Alec would be able to protect Connor from legal consequences easier than he could protect his son. The Murdochs immediately controlled the narrative that night. And because of their quick work, the public was confused as to who was driving the boat. The problem is every kid on that boat has stated with 100% certainty that the very intoxicated Paul Murdoch was driving the boat that night. Controlling the narrative is a foundational principle of the powerful and corrupt. When Alex staged his so-called murder for hire on the side of the road a few months after the murders, it was just another frantic attempt to control the narrative. Alec was a lawyer and he knew the life insurance was not contestable so he would, could certainly kill himself if he wanted to be dead. All he had to do was take a bag of the pills he had in his pocket. He did not need to have someone shoot him for goodness sakes. It was just another attempt to control the narrative. But this attempt went wrong. And there are many examples here of corruption in controlling the narrative. We see it in the Akeem Pickney story, the Stephen Smith case, the Gloria Satterfield case, and even Paul's DUI drunk accident with his girlfriend. Corrupt officials who are in power have a way of controlling and manipulating the narrative. Alec Murdoch was a master manipulator. He ultimately used his power and trust from others to steal $14 million from his clients and his law firm. According to the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, more will be revealed about the corruption of this family. Some say this murder case will be overturned on appeal because of Rule 404B. For the record, I will read that rule here. 
Evidence of other crimes, wrongs, or acts is not admissible to prove the character of a person in order to show action in conformity therewith. It may, however, be admissible to show motive, identity, the existence of a common scheme or plan, the absence of mistake or accident or intent. I am not a lawyer. I am an undertaker. But put me down with a group that believes Alec Murdoch's guilty verdict will never be overturned. No way. For starters, the prosecution made the financial crimes in the boat case admissible with their theory for the motive of the murders. But before the judge ruled on the admissibility, the defense opened the door for this evidence when they questioned their witness about Alec's character. The judge ruled on the spot in favor of the prosecution to allow evidence about his character. And what is a defense attorney's worst fear? Opening the door to something that isn't coming in. Now let's face it, as a defense attorney, we've all done it. You've been in the moment and you ask a question and maybe it wasn't the best uh, articulated question and next thing you know you get an answer that wasn't really asked of because it was a poorly drafted question and then guess what? You've opened the door to stuff that's not coming in. Well, that's what has happened to Alec Murdoch's counsel. So the whole use of Alec Murdoch's financial trouble as a motive for the uh, deaths of Paul and Maggie, specifically the murders, can be permitted per Judge Newman. The court will rule on the admissibility of specific evidence pointing to Alec Murdoch's financial crimes as the trial progresses, the judge said. He shared that in the court's view, based upon legal precedent, the evidence is valid as a broader context to the circumstances of the murders. He said the defense opened the door by asking witnesses about their knowledge of Paul Murdoch's 2019 boating accident and if they could think of any reason why Alex Murdoch would kill his wife and son. That's right. So, as we stated, the defense objected to the prosecutors going into the questions um, of the witness of Will Loving, a childhood friend of Paul Murdoch's, uh, about his knowledge of Alex Murdoch's significant money issues at the time, specifically the $792,000 in missing fees owed to the former law firm. The witness was asked by the defense whether he could think of any reason why Mr. Murdoch would commit the crimes that he was committing. Newman said that, in effect, turned the cross-examination of the witness from dealing with specific issues of the case to having that witness testify as a character witness. Again, I am not a lawyer, but that was a major blunder on the part of the defense. But I think he would have still been found guilty, even if the financial issues had not been admissible. Another big piece to this was Alec Murdoch was not the only one on trial here. The entire justice system of South Carolina was on trial after almost 100 years of corruption. Add the obvious reversal of roles in this case. Here we had an experienced and obviously brilliant African-American judge in charge of the trial of a powerful, privileged white man with the integrity of the entire judicial system hanging in the balance. Folks, the verdict ain't going to be reversed, and it shouldn't be. More could be coming for Alec Murdoch and his family, the financial crimes we know about, but there are potentially other things coming we don't exactly know about. Alec Murdoch will die in prison, which brings me to the point of this narrative, and maybe I will ask this as a question. Are we supposed to be happy when we see the picture of Alec's shaved head and his new mugshot in the jumpsuit? Does thinking about how far he has fallen make us feel glad or better about ourselves? I think there's something inside most normal people that has a very difficult time kicking a man when he is down. Anybody can kick someone who is helpless. I had followed this case for 21 months. I read articles and listened to podcasts. I had a good understanding of his level of corruption, knowing how he operated and the decent people from whom he stole. 
Contrary to many, I had no trouble believing the monster he had become. Anyone who will look at a quadriplegic in the eye and steal his money that was rightfully his will do anything. I knew he was capable of anything. But as I began watching the trial, I did not know if he had really murdered his wife and son. I was hoping he had not. As time went on in the trial, I became convinced he did do this. After watching that trial for six weeks, if I had been on that jury, I would have found him guilty in the first minute of the jury deliberation. His story was not credible. His defense lawyers could not make it credible, even though they tried hard to make it so. In fact, I found myself thinking I would be really upset if they find him not guilty. I don't know why, really. I don't have a dog in that fight, to be sure. I would also not have been surprised if the jury was deadlocked, simply because I thought it would be difficult for an entire group of local people to see past the man who seemingly helped many in his life, including maybe some of those on the jury or their families. But after less than three hours, the jury came back with a unanimous verdict of guilty. I found myself shouting out loud, yes, yes, yes. Then Judge Newman looked at him eye to eye and said words that will forever be memorialized in the hearts of those who heard it. This has been perhaps one of the most troubling cases, not just for me as a judge, for the state, for the defense team, but for all of the citizens in this community, all the citizens in this state, and as we have seen based on the media coverage there throughout the nation, you have a wife who's been killed, murdered, a son savage, savage, just savagely murdered, a lawyer, a person from a respected family who has controlled justice in this community for over a century, a person whose grandfather's portrait hang at the back of the courthouse that I had to have ordered removed in order to ensure that a fair trial was had by both the state and the defense. And I've sat through the trial, not only have I sat through the trial, but also as the presiding judge of the state grand jury sat through and participated in the issuance of search warrants of various sorts, bond hearings, and uh, have had to consider many things. And we have this case, and I'm also assigned to preside over 99 others, at least 99 other cases. Uh, though testimony has come up regarding many of those other cases, uh, I will not make any comment with, with regard to any other pending matter as I have been assigned those cases as well. It's also particularly troubling, uh, Mr. Murdoch because uh, as a member of the legal community and a well-known member of the legal community, uh, you've practiced law before me and, and we've seen each other at various occasions throughout the years. And it was especially heartbreaking for me to see you um, go on go in the media from being a, uh, a grieving father who lost a wife and a son to being the person 
indicted and convicted of killing them. And you've engaged in such duplicitous conduct uh, here in the courtroom, here on the witness stand, and as established by the testimony throughout the time leading from the time of the indictment and prior to the indictment throughout the trial to this moment in time, uh, certainly you uh, have no obligation to say anything other than saying not guilty. <clears throat> and obviously as appeals are probably expected or absolutely expected, I would not uh, expect a confession of any kind. In fact, as I've presided over murder cases over the past 22 years, I have yet to find a defendant who could go there, who could go back to that moment in time when they decided to pull the trigger or to otherwise murder someone. I have not been able to get anyone, any defendant, even those who have confessed to being guilty, to go back and explain to me what happened at that moment in time when they opted to pull the trigger, when they opted to commit the most heinous crimes known to man. In this case, qualifies under our death penalty statute based on statutory, the statutory aggravating circumstances of two or more people being murdered by the defendant by one act or pursuant to one scheme or course of conduct. I don't question at all the decision of the state not to pursue the death penalty. But as I sit here in this courtroom and look around the many um, portraits of judges and other court officials and reflect on the fact that over the past century, your family, including you, have been prosecuting people here in this courtroom and many have received the death penalty probably for lesser conduct remind me of the expression you uh, gave on the witness stand was it tangled Oh, what tangle web we weave. What did you mean by that? And then when I lied, I continued to lie. <clears throat> and the question is, when will it end? When will it end? And it, it's ended already for the jury because they've concluded that you continue to lie and lie throughout your testimony and perhaps with all the throng of people here they for the most part all believe or 80 90 percent 99 percent believe that you continue to lie now when you your statement of denial uh, to the court perhaps you believe that it's, it does not matter that there's nothing that can mitigate a sentence given the crime, crimes that were committed. You know, a notice of alibi was filed in this case 
by counsel in November, and we conducted a hearing, pretrial hearing, in which you claim to have been someplace else at the time the crime was committed. Then, after all of the witnesses placed you at the scene of the crime, at the last minute, the last minutes or days, you, 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 you switch courses and admit it to being there. And then that necessitated more lies and continued to lie. And, um, and I said, where will it end? It's already ended for many who have heard you and uh, concluded that it'll never end. But within your own soul, you have to deal with that. As happy as I was that justice had been served, and as much as I knew the jury got it right, I swallowed hard when they handcuffed Alec Murdoch and took him out of the courtroom. I swallowed hard again later that night when they released his latest mugshot as he was getting ready to be processed in a prison among the most violent of offenders. I also could not help but think about Buster, his only living son, and what he was thinking. I understand he may have some guilt of his own, but I surely have no way of knowing that. So far, there are only rumors, and he's certainly innocent until proven guilty. But even if he is guilty, he's still a victim in all this. The rest of his family is also struggling. Regardless of the possible corruption in that family, their world, as they knew it, has fallen apart. I guess we could say, well, good for them. They deserve whatever they get. But I remember that not a single one of us can throw a stone. Jesus' words in John chapter 8, He is that without sin among you. Let him first cast the stone. I think one of our faults as human beings is we tend to take pride in the fact that we know somebody who is worse than us. That somehow makes us feel better, we think. The law has taken its course and justice has been served, and that's a good thing. Two human beings were murdered, and there's a price to pay for that. There are consequences to bad acts. There always have been. But we were not appointed the judge or the jury. Those 12 who served were appointed, and they did their job. And I believe they did it well. But the rest of us are just onlookers, kind of normal people living out our lives in a fallen world, left trying to make sense of it. What should our reaction to Alec be after this verdict? Well, actually, the Bible is rather clear on this subject. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. He also said in the same Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 and 2, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. These verses, among others, emphasize the importance of us as Christians, showing mercy and compassion to others, even those who have done wrong and even wronged us, and even after the judicial system has run its course. Rather than judging and condemning others, the Bible encourages us to extend grace and forgiveness to others, as we have been shown grace and forgiveness by God. The last mugshot of Alec Murdoch is one that will be seared in our memories. It is a real picture of what rock bottom looks like, a picture of what many bad decisions look like in the end, a picture of a broken human being, a picture of the words of Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. At the end of the day, if we look at Eric's mugshot photo with delight and pride, we should probably take another look 
in the mirror. On the other hand, if we look at Elik and his family with compassion, we begin to do our part to make the world a better place. The Bible teaches us to cultivate humility, recognizing that all our abilities and achievements come from God and that we're all equally in need of his grace and mercy. As we humble ourselves before God and others, we can gain wisdom and avoid the pitfalls of pride. There really are no winners here. But showing compassion reflects the love and grace of God. It can help us to grow in empathy, forgiveness, and humility. Oh, there are huge lessons here. Wrong decisions that take us further than we want to go, keep us longer than we want to stay, and cost us more than we want to pay. But maybe the greatest lesson for all of us who watch from a distance is one about compassion, a reminder of the theme of one of the greatest parables Jesus ever told about our role when we see someone who is at the end of their rope. Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Peter said, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. In the end, Elliot Murdoch's conviction does not constitute a victory lap for any of us but it should give all of us the urge to humbly pray for our fellow man and demonstrate the transformative power of God's grace and love. Viewing life from a hearse, it could be worse. Laugh, think, and cry with the country undertaker.